Hello and welcome to our program. August of 2004 marks the 100th anniversary of the incorporation of our city. It's a wonderful time to reflect on what makes our city so special. Like this building, for instance. Uh, it's the Festival Playhouse. But it's also one of the oldest buildings in the city of Arvada, built in 1874. It originally was a Grange Hall. We bought it in 1990 and have been performing plays here ever since. Well, it's a magical sort of a place. The actors, the audience, the children are what make it magical. People. People are what make Arvada special too. In this program we would like you to meet some of the people who first settled in our area. It began over 150 years ago, long before superhighways, with prospectors looking for gold. Nevada, like so many 21st century cities, seems to be a maze of roadways guiding bustling travelers from place to place. But it was a different story in 1850. Then, it was dusty or sometimes muddy trails, trickling creeks, and rushing waterways that guided travelers more slowly across the plains of Colorado. Arvada's story begins along such trails and creeks, at a site where gold was first found here in Colorado. It was a spot where waterways we now call Ralston Creek and Clear Creek joined together. Here, on the eastern fringes of Arvada, is where a wagon train of gold seekers traveling from Oklahoma to California made camp one summer day in 1850. The pioneers had been on the trail 43 days. The diary of one of the travelers, John Lowry Brown, reveals what happened. Left the Platte and traveled six miles to Creek. Good water, grass, and timber. Lay by, gold found this morning. It was June 22, 1850. In a margin of the diary, Brown had written. We called this Ralston's Creek because a man of that name found gold here. Lewis Ralston was one of about 130 people traveling with the wagon train. The group decided to continue to California, but history recorded the now famous location of Colorado's first gold find. And it was also the beginnings of Arvada. While the excitement of finding gold in Ralston Creek that summer of 1850 didn't set off a gold rush, pioneers who came with the later 1859 gold rush found their way back to Ralston's Creek. And this time, they discovered another type of wealth, soil rich enough for agriculture. By the early 1860s, a small settlement had sprung up, with some of Arvada's early pioneers calling it Ralston's Point, or just Ralston. You can look and just visualize what was here. There was nothing. There was a Clear Creek ran down there, and I believe you could, it was even visible from this point. There probably were maybe a dozen families that lived here, Swadleys, the Yoakums, the Graves. It was just really a small community at that time. George Swadley is said to have been a carpenter who left his Virginia home in 1859. He was looking for gold north of us, around Boulder. The story goes that a business partner sold the mine claim there out from under him, then disappeared. With that, Swadley moved down here to present-day Arvada for the winter. Here he helped dig the area's first ditch. Known as the Wadsworth Ditch today, it was completed February 25, 1860. A second ditch soon followed, the Swadley Ditch. Both were intended to be used for mining. But by May of 1860, Swadley also hoped to use the ditch water to coax crops from the ground. And with this, he had more luck. His first crop, onions, was a huge success. By the fall of 1860, Swadley was building his first home here. They built a home out what was on the west end of Arvada, because at that time, Carr Street was the end, and about 57th and Dudley, where the library is, they had the old Swadley house. 
In 1866, Swadley married Mary Ellen Pollock, who had come here with her family from Missouri. The Swadleys had five children. George Swadley was the president of the First National Bank of Arvada from the time of its founding in 1904 until his death on January 12, 1906. John Yoakum was a farmer who left his native Prussia under the threat of being drafted into the army. He settled in the Arvada area and did what he knew best, farming. Soon he was the envy of neighbors, raising great crops of beans and other vegetables. In 1863, Yoakum went looking for a wife and found her in Missouri. Anna Weber, born in Germany and now settled in Missouri with her family, married John Yoakum in 1863. They came back to Arvada, where they homesteaded and bought land for their crops. Their 400 acres lay roughly between the present-day boundaries of West 44th, Kipling, Grandview, and Garrison. They were very influential throughout the town and also have a ditch name for them. And their family's been here for years and years. The daughter-in-law, Marguerite Yoakum, was superintendent of schools for Jefferson County. She was a principal at Lawrence School for quite a few years. Her ancestor, John Yoakum, was not only famous for his crops, but for having a big heart. He was known to give generously to the community. They gave money to the city for several things. Uh, one of the main things being at the Arvada Cemetery in 1863, which still is a very lovely cemetery today. As you walk through there, you can see these pioneer graves. About 1861, another pioneer farmer came to Ralston's Point and took up a ranch claim here. Oliver Graves was already about 48 or 49 years old and had spent much of his life traveling between his home in Illinois and the gold mines of California and Colorado. Now, he brought his wife, Lucy Graves, and six surviving children to Colorado, where he settled down to farming 160 acres for the rest of his life. One of their homes was at 5478 Marshall Street. What is now Marshall was called Graves for years and years and years. In fact, until in the late 40s when they renamed all the streets. While Oliver Graves spent his time farming, one of his sons brought a little industry to Ralston's Point. William Graves was only 14 years old when he came to Colorado with his father in 1862. But in 1868, he bought a threshing machine and three years later went into that business. His machines left their mark around town. He destroyed several local bridges by taking his, his thresh and machine across them. William Graves also owned a blacksmith shop in Old Town. The Graves family, like Arvada's other pioneers, were a close-knit group in a growing, proud community. And when William Graves died, it seems most of the town turned out for his funeral. It was 1912, a mere 62 years after Lewis Ralston's golden discovery at Ralston's Creek. In 1859, a Canadian named William M. Allen came to Ralston's Point and claimed 160 acres, part of which is now the Allendale subdivision. It's hard to imagine looking at it today, but a ferry was once used to cross Ralston Creek where Sims Street is located today. The creek is said to be much wider back in 1863 when Arvada pioneer Harpin Davis homesteaded in the area and built and operated the ferry. This is a wonderful old building, uh, and it's often filled with laughter and applause these days. Oh, I love those times. But when it's quieter, like now, it is not difficult to think back to those days when Benjamin Wadsworth and his neighbors would gather here for a, for a meeting, uh, for a Grange meeting. There were several Grange halls that were around in the area during the 1870s. And it was said that, that Wadsworth would, would get on his horse and, and go up and down the streets clanging a bell saying, Grange meeting tonight. <laughs> Wadsworth's foresight in bringing the community of farmers together has given him the distinction of being Arvada's primary town founder.
At the opening of 1870, the little farming community called Ralston's Point was on the threshold of a new era. For by the end of the year, two factors would come together to form a town that would unite the pioneer families. First, the Colorado Central Railroad would complete its winding route past the farmlands on its way to Golden. And second, a determined man named Benjamin Franklin Wadsworth would settle his family here. It was a stroke of luck that we had the train, but it was also a stroke of luck that we had a man called Benjamin Franklin Wadsworth because he had such vision for the town. Benjamin came to Colorado by wagon train with his wife Mary in 1863. They were drawn to the mountains in search of gold and first settled in the town of Empire. But Wadsworth was also a good businessman. While he bought and sold mining claims, he also acquired land, some of it around Ralston's Point. It proved to be a fortunate decision, for when a great fire destroyed the mountain town of Empire in 1869, Benjamin moved his family here. A rustic log cabin served as home until their beautiful brick home at the site of present-day Upham and Grandview could be built. But Wadsworth's vision extended far beyond his own backyard. He had a dream for what the community could be and the foresight to make it happen. The Colorado Central would help make his plan a reality. It would help put the new town on the map, and it would also bring something very important to the remote little farming community, the mail. But getting a post office required naming the town. Wadsworth gave that job to his wife, Mary. In 1870, Ralston's Point became Arvada, in honor of Mary Wadsworth's brother-in-law, Hiram Arvada Haskins. And Wadsworth became the town's first postmaster. The little log cabin that he and the family had lived in when they first moved to the area then became the post office. It was a post office while I lived there. And Wadsworth had wooden boxes labeled A to Z. And when the mail sack was thrown off the train as it slowed down for the crossing at Center and Railroad Street, which is old Wadsworth and Grandview today, he would pick up the sack and sort out the mail and people would come in and pick it up, which was certainly better than driving to Denver. In 1870, the mail delivery we take for granted today was a great accomplishment, yet it was only one of the many achievements that Wadsworth's modern descendants reflect on with pride. You have, feel a pride in that, that, that even in your own close family, we never did anything that was very noteworthy, but we had forebears who did. My son, Ronnie, he tells everybody he knows that Wadsworth Boulevard is named after our great-grandfather Wadsworth. <laughs> Everybody gets a big kick out of that. Marguerite Jones lived in the town her great-great-grandfather founded for 40 years. But she also has links to other important pioneer families here. The daughter of Benjamin Franklin Wadsworth was Mary, and she married John Graves, who was my dad's father. While Mary Emma's husband, John, was mostly interested in farming, his brother, William Graves, showed interest in blacksmithing. And Wadsworth encouraged him by donating land for a blacksmith shop. It was one of the first businesses in the little town Wadsworth was now designing on his own land. He was a giver, he gave and he gave, but he was also a very good businessman. And he knew that this town could not move forward unless we had certain uh, things in place that meant that the town could prosper, things that would benefit everyone. That they would benefit him to, too was of course all right. Wadsworth was wasting no time. In December 1870, just a year after he'd moved here, he filed a plat for a nine block area on his land. But this founder of Arvada had more than business on his mind. A conservative educated man, building schools and churches was high on his list. A devout Methodist, he helped build the first Methodist church of the town. He donated land and money for it and was careful to oversee its construction with beautiful stained glass windows in 1892. Children were playing on the lot where the church was being built and they threw a rock which broke one of the windows. 
Mr. Wadsworth, being the kind of man he was, immediately took down the window, got his horse and buggy, and started off to Denver to have the window repaired. On his return journey, he had padded the window so it was very safe. But there was no such thing as seat belts back then, and he was jogging along at a pretty good clip when a barking dog ran out and bit his horse on the nose. The frightened horse drove the buggy up on the sidewalk, and Mr. Wadsworth was tossed out on his head, and he never did regain consciousness. He was 66 years old. He never did get to see the church finished, to which he had given so much. After his death, Center Street was renamed Wadsworth Avenue in his honor. As the town's primary founder, Benjamin Franklin Wadsworth left more than buildings and streets behind. He also left a legacy of progress that would allow Arvada to move into the 1900s, incorporate, and continue to prosper and grow. Though Arvada was named after Hiram Arvada Haskins, the name Arvada is thought to come from the Bible, a name meaning strong rowers and referring to men of courage. It's thought that this may be what Mary Wadsworth had in mind when she named the town. Wadsworth was Arvada's postmaster until 1882, when he turned the job over to Eli Allen and moved the post office over to a building known today as the Cheshire Cat. Just a few blocks from where I am standing, another Arvada founder built his home and raised his family here. Louis Reno was a strong community leader and, and very active in civic affairs, and he was a neighbor of Benjamin Wadsworth. It could be said that what Wadsworth started, Reno finished. As the town of Arvada took its new name in 1870, Louis Reno diligently pursued his family's tradition of farming. But his 40-acre homestead near the railroad tracks was destined to become more than farmland. Reno would ultimately use it to double the size of a little town laid out mostly on Benjamin Wadsworth's property that year. For Reno's land was just west of Wadsworth's and the two neighbors shared more than a property line. They shared a vision for Arvada's future. From his front porch, Reno had frequent reminders of the progress that railroad could bring to Arvada's growing community. He was eager to help shape that progress and would indeed become known as Arvada's other founder. Reno settled here in 1863. He had heard great stories of the West from his brother John. And Lewis might never have come here to leave his mark as a founder of Arvada had it not been for John's somewhat tall tales. John had run away from home at the age of 14 to escape the toil of the family farm. But prospecting, now that was different. And like other prospectors of the era, John Reno's wanderlust took him on journeys far and wide. One of his trips was here to Ralston's Point around 1859. While he did pan for gold, he also helped George Swadley dig the area's earliest ditches and lived alongside other hard-working pioneer families. But his letters home to Lewis in Iowa were filled with stories a little more grand. Lewis's daughter, Ethel, wrote down the stories for her granddaughter. He just evidently was writing back to the uh, people, his people, and telling them how good it was out here. Farming land, gold. Ralston Creek was just lots of gold. You've got to come out. But the Civil War had broken out, and he joined up as a drummer in the war effort first. After his discharge in 1863, he was back working his dad's farm in Iowa. Still, the excitement of his brother's letters lingered with him. Lewis convinced his dad and step family to pack up and head west. So they signed up with the uh, wagon train. They went down to Missouri with their oxen, and uh, the whole works of them came out. In the same time, the Evans family came out, and I believe, oh, it must have looked like I-70. It really should have. Some of the Allens, they're listed on the same train. 
so a lot of them came out together. And they came out here in 1863. It wasn't unusual for the Reno clan to take off in search of a new beginning now and then, but this journey had its own mark of adventure. On the way here, one of the young girls, his half-sister, wandered too far away from the wagons. They used to walk, the kids would walk and play because oxen were so slow, and the Indians got her. They didn't hurt her. She was a teenager. She was only gone, I think, one day, and uh, they brought her back. That was enough, you know, with a teenager, that's enough. <laughs> but there was no trouble with him or anything. The Renos made it to Ralston's Point and settled down to what the family knew best, farming. John stayed for a while until he got restless again, then moved on. It's said that his travels took him round the world. He was the character of the family, obviously. He supposedly went through three fortunes, but when he died, he died a pauper. He was in Arizona, and Louis Reno had to pay for his funeral expense. Louis's farmstead along the railroad tracks, where Old Wadsworth runs through Old Town today, provided for his family. In 1877, at about the age of 44, he married Matilda Otto, a Pennsylvania Dutch woman from Rochester, Pennsylvania. They had four children and were said to be immensely happy together in that time. The children were all born in the family's first modest home, but Louis and Matilda later built a more elegant home. It once stood at the northwest corner of present-day Grandview and Old Wadsworth. It's believed the Renos were friends with the Swadleys who live west of them, and the Graves family southeast of them. But Reno descendants are inclined to believe that Reno and his neighbor Wadsworth had more of a business-like acquaintance. They both saw the prospects for a nice town out here. They had a railroad through here, beautiful farmland. And I think that they, they recognized this as founders, and that's when they decided, okay, let's go ahead and start the ball rolling. Wadsworth started it, and then Reno threw his in. Wadsworth laid out the first town plat in 1870, mostly on his land. Years later, in 1890, Reno divided much of his homestead, filed a new plat, and began selling off his land. Lewis's daughter wrote how she remembers it happening. And the upper 40 was put into 25-foot lots about 1890 and sold for $50 a pair, all of which was sold before Dad died in 1906. But she said, just think uh, of buying a pair of lots for $50. Hard to believe, isn't it? But in 1890, it was different. Reno's new plat extended the town west to present-day Allison. And Lewis's daughter recalled in her memoirs that her father and Wadsworth had somewhat different ideas about what to allow on their lands. When he deeded his half of the street, there was never to be any liquor sold on his property. So all the taverns and beer parlors are on the Reno side of the street. <laughs> I, I don't know how to explain it, but this is the way it happened. <laughs> According to my grandmother, she said her father was, always had the uh, let live. If you can buy and you go along with the law, he had no objections to anything like that. And evidently, Mr. Wadsworth did. So Reno said, well, you just go ahead and put them on my side. I don't care. Although he never drank. And my uh, grandmother said that there was never any alcohol whatsoever in their home. They just wouldn't, her mother would not tolerate it. Matilda ran an orderly home, and both she and Lewis were active in town events. But Lewis, in particular, was involved in founding many of Arvada's earliest organizations. He was very proud of the town that he could help out. I know my grandmother told me this, and she always called him Papa. Papa was very proud that he could uh, give contribution. That's why he wanted to be on the Arvada uh, Cemetery Board. He went involved, and he was with the Grange. Um, he was very, I think, very happy with the town. He really was. And he took a very good leading role when it came time to, to do the financing for the new Arvada School, which was built in 1900. He was on the school board and, and was a great contributor. Tragedy struck the Reno family in 1888. Their fifth child, Adna Irene, died before reaching three months of age. Shortly after, Matilda developed cancer and suffered greatly for years. Yet Lewis continued to have a guiding hand in the town he built and loved so much. I think he never regretted coming out here. I think he was very happy with it. 
Louis Reno lived here for 43 years. By the time of his death in 1906, the town he had helped found had become incorporated and started some of the traditions that still live on today. This tree could be seen for miles around and was a beacon for people coming to Arvada. It was a very beautiful tree and it was built so it kind of grew in a crook and so it made a bench for people to sit on so that was part of the mystique for the whole thing. And because it had been here and people knew about it, they used to have uh, picnics up on top of Packberry Hill. But it was like sometimes symbols grow to be larger than life. And I think that this Hackberry tree probably wasn't as large or as wonderful as time would have us believe. And yet there's nothing wrong with having a tree for a symbol. That's great. Our traditions, our founding, these graceful buildings of yesteryear and the people, that's what makes Arvada so special. There are only a few communities in the metro area, or in the state for that matter, that can boast such a rich pioneer heritage as ours. In the coming months, KATV will explore that legacy even further. I'm Charlie Alt. Thanks for watching.